am completely obsessed, as Henry suggested, about jobs. In terms of my particular obsession, in the first decade of this century, it was all about trade. And in fact, when you heard you know, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump come to places like Michigan to talk about NAFTA, et cetera, I mean, I used to campaign on this theme, NAFTA and CAFTA have given us the shafta, because <laughs> people really saw it. I'm not kidding you. I mean, in communities all across the state, these hulking, Rem remnants of factories were there as physical manifestations of how communities had been hollowed out, right, by what we were determining as unenforced trade agreements. We're not afraid of trade in any way, shape, or form. We just want it to be fair, right? We want our trading partners to be held to the same standards that we are, and we want to be able to build products here and send them somewhere else without having walls uh, built up. But the first dec decade of this century was all for Michigan about trade. The second decade of this century is all about this issue of robots and automation and how much displacement has occurred. So MIT has recently came out with a study saying 670,000 manufacturing jobs um, lost to robots in this uh, century so far. I, I wonder. So I just want to give some hope for this. So is it true? that we are going to see massive unemployment as a result of automation. Well, if you look back, I mean, it's, many of you know this, the classic example of automation being introduced to replace jobs is the ATM, right? Of course there are fewer tellers because of the introduction of the ATM, right? You would think it makes perfect sense. But what happened? Since 2000, the number of full-time bank tellers has actually increased by 2% per year while the labor force grew at just a rate of 0.6%. So obviously more bank tellers are being hired. Why could that possibly be? Well. Obviously, it's much cheaper to have an ATM than a bank teller. All these banks started saving money as a result of that, and they invested in opening up more branches. And the tellers themselves are doing more sophisticated operations than just cashing checks or depositing checks. They're selling the bank products, et cetera. There's much more of a face-forward view to the customers. There's more people employed as bank tellers today than there were during the advent of the ATM. Similarly, Cash barcode, you know, barcode scanners supposed to replace the cashier. What happened? The, uh, from 1980 through 2013, cashiers have grown 2.1%. As I mentioned, the workforce increased only at 0.6%. You've seen more cashiers rather than fewer cashiers. This all emanates from a classic example that economists often use, which is that of the loom, the noble loom. When it was, you know, when it was introduced at the beginning of the 19th century, so 1800 or whatever, obviously people were weaving cloth by hand. And what did that mean? That meant it was super expensive for you to get a suit. Not you, you weren't there. But at the time, those people, they, didn't, they couldn't buy more than one or two garments or outfits because it was so expensive. So the loom gets introduced, and there was great fear that the loom was going to, especially the factory loom, was going to eliminate these weaver jobs. But what, in fact, happened is that the number of factory weavers increased by 400% during that period. Classic supply and demand. The cost of making clothing dropped. Therefore, the demand for clothing increased. People could have more than one set of clothes, and therefore, the amount of workers that were necessary to operate the looms, because there were more looms, et cetera, increased. So I take this as a slight bit of hope when we consider automation, because, and this is somebody we should definitely get to come to the Goldman School, um, James Besson at Boston University studied the impact of technology on 317 professions. This was from 1980 to 200, 2013. 317 professions. Every one of them had automation introduced to the profession. And what he found was that in every one of those cases that employment grows significantly when technology is introduced to the profession. So that gives me some hope. Does it not give you some hope? Yes, you with me on this? All right. There's one job that was actually eliminated by technology. Anybody know what it is? One job of the 317, one job. It was 
the elevator operator. The noble elevator operator really is no more, unless in you know showy places like you know the Drake Hotel or whatever. But that was the job that was eliminated. So with this in mind, this is why I want to talk about this, the mother of all technology platforms, which is the, obviously, uh, driverless car, the autonomous vehicle. Um, now, I'm particularly concerned about this, of course, because of Michigan. Michigan being the home of the auto industry, the domestic auto industry, other than uh, Tesla, of course. Uh, really concerned about what this means for those particular players and for the workers who work in that industry. So, in light of that, it made me start thinking, and I've been talking to a lot of people, okay, what are the really cool things that could happen with the advent of this particular technology? And if you start to think about, you know, what could people do? So, say you're going tomorrow to Los Angeles for a meeting, and you get in your autonomous vehicle tonight, and it's literally a motel. You don't have to drive. You've got your, look at this. You've got your bed, you got your toilet, you have your sink, you even have your guitar for when you're bored. I mean, how cool. And you wake up in Los Angeles. You don't have to pay for a hotel. How cool is that? If you want to go to a shorter distance, of course, kids have always had this in the back of the car, but now you have your pop-pop popcorn and your movies for your drive-in movie theater, and you end up in the place you want to be. Or other benefits. Of course, you could have this massive parking issue, which we find all over the Bay Area, which is insane. Or you could have streets that have space now, because maybe you won't need to park because these autonomous vehicles may be part of a service, so you won't need to have a car parked in the front of the street. And what does this mean for the streets? It means that these cafes maybe can expand, create new spaces for eating, living, whatever, more bike paths, et cetera, outside. If you have, if you decide to use a uh, service like Uber, but it's autonomous. What does that mean for your garages? You're not going to need a garage anymore. That means you could convert your garage to an, uh, an Airbnb place or some place for your kids to live or a low-income housing all across the region, which is ridiculously expensive out, of he out here. I can't believe how expensive it is to live. I say that as somebody who was living in Michigan for 30 years. I cannot believe it. Okay, that's my rant. But... <laughs> But truly, these garage potential conversions are an opportunity. Well, what if you don't have to buy a car? What if you don't have to pay for your insurance? Can you imagine how many thousands of dollars families and the country would save from insurance costs 38,000 deaths per year from car accidents? There's obviously benefits uh, to that. And of course, there's the issue of jobs. So, Many people have been writing about, you know, if they ever get the bugs out, autonomous cars will put a lot of human drivers out of work. And in fact, if you think about it, there are right now 5 million people who make their living driving, whether they're taxis or truck drivers, et cetera. Uh, it's 3% of the workforce right now. Um, it has been described as the same size of a shock as the decline in manufacturing uh, since 2000. It's, um, it's significant, right? It's a huge deal, especially for, again, the folks who are making their living in that way. If any of you saw recently, there was, uh, it was last year, um, Auto, which is owned um, by Uber, drove their first beer truck without a driver. I mean, there was a guy sitting in the cab but no, no touching this, the, the wheel. And the truck driving industry really loves this notion of self-driving trucks, right? Because you don't have to worry about pulling over to sleep. You don't have to worry about any of the rest stops. You don't have to worry about anything, assuming that it's all safe and it gets their equipment to them uh, quickly. So huge opportunity for business. But the question is on jobs, is there any hope? So I have to cite. Um, en Enrico Moretti, who's a great Berkeley uh, professor and incredible um, you know, author, et cetera, uh, researcher, he says that when technology is int introduced, every new job in the tech sector, which I would say autonomous vehicles would be, has the potential to generate five complementary jobs 
elsewhere. We don't know what those jobs are. It's hard to imagine what those jobs are. In fact, there is the classic example of the Gutenberg printing press. So the Gutenberg printing press obviously had huge impact on reading books. But who could have foreseen that the Gutenberg printing press also would cause the need to have another product, which is eyeglasses. People started reading and they're going, man, I can't see this. So the Gutenberg printing press actually created eyeglasses or created somebody who stepped up and said, we're gonna, from the island of Murano, right outside of Venice, they make glass. And that, that's where the first glasses were made. And you put those two glasses together and the Gutenberg printing press led to the development of the telescope and the microscope, excuse me, the microscope and the telescope. But who would have thought that from the Gutenberg printing press? So if you think about autonomous vehicles, who knows what could be developing, right? Well, when you think about it, there's all these products that go inside of an autonomous vehicle. But then there's all the stuff that you can't even imagine, right? What, what's going to happen with jobs in logistics? What's going to happen with jobs in charging electric autonomous vehicles, or in networking, or in construction, or in entertainment? I mean, there's a whole realm of possibilities that we don't even know because it's not here yet. So I want to blow your mind just a little bit. There is a um, professor out of Stanford, I'm so sorry, but <laughs> named Tony Seba, who runs a think tank. And the think tank just issued this report. Uh, for its, the think tank is called Rethink X. And in this report was Rethinking Transportation. Has anybody seen this before? You've seen it. All right, so Tony Seba is, a, 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 I would say, an aggressive thinker. Um, he is, is that fair to say about, he's an aggressive thinker. He is focused on disruption. And he's focused on the economics of disruption. And so he did this, he and his team at Rethink X did this report on the future of the autonomous vehicle. And I want to share with you some of what he's projecting based upon his um, disruption and his uh, sort of formula for what causes disruption. And this is a, a slide that he uses all the time. This is 1900. This is a street scene in New York City. Of course, there are a lot of horse-drawn car carriages. And the question is, you know, can you find the car in 1900? There is a car in there, and you in the back can't see it. But it's that little one right there. That's 1900, 13 years later. Can you find the horse? <laughs> Seriously, the horse is right there. Everything else is a car. 13 years and this huge technology platform, which was the internal combustion engine, became ubiquitous. 13 years. All right, we're in 2017. I want to share with you five projections from Rethinking Transportation that I find, whether it goes this fast or not, I don't know. But for public policy students and for us to think forward, there are so many ramifications on this. And that's what I wanted us to think about just quickly. So number one projection is it is going to happen fast. And I'll zoom in on this so you in the back can see it. First of all, legislatures in uh, four states have, one, two, three, four, five states, have already adopted bills uh, permitting autonomous driving. All of the states that are in yellow are considering it, and the ones that are in red have tried it and have failed. But you can see the number of states that are thinking about it, right? So once it happens, and Tony Sieber predicts around 2020, you'll see a tipping point of legislatures that have passed it, that pass it. Individu what he's predicting is that individually owned ICE, that's internal combustion engine, vehicles, right, non-electric but internal combustion engine vehicles, gasoline vehicles, will cease being sold by around 2024. Can you imagine? All right, I know you're skeptical. I am too, but the economics are amazing, and I want to share with you in that for a second. But this is what the numbers is he's saying, is that independently owned I.O., independently owned cars, by 2020, there will be about 247 million of them on the road, in general, in the U.S., 247 million. By 2030, what they are suggesting from rethinking uh, transportation is that there will be 44 million 
by 2030, in that decade, huge drop in individually owned cars. So that means you may decide that it's not worth your while to own your own vehicle, but you might decide to use the service instead. So by 2030, 95% of miles traveled will be TAS platforms. TAS means transportation as a service. So that you may be using it like Uber to dial up your autonomous vehicle and go places. All right, 95%, that's what they're projecting. So it's gonna happen fast. That's number one, projection. Number two, prediction is that the transportation cost is going to plummet. Now this is, this just, I have to say this, because this is the nut of the projection on what disruption is. Once the cost plummets, it becomes irresistible, right? So by 2030, trans traveling via transportation as a service, or a TAS electric uh, platform, electric autonomous vehicles will be massively cheaper than by your individually owned internal combustion engine vehicle, gas powered vehicle. So this is what it looks like according again to this think tank. The cost per mile by 2020 and by 2030. So if you have a new vehicle in 2020, you will be paying 65 cents a mile. If you just purchased your new internal combustion engine vehicle. By 2030, if you had one, you'd be paying 75 cents a mile. So just keep those two in mind, that's our start point. Um, the used internal combustion engine vehicle, you'd be paying 34 cents a mile in, in both places. If you had transportation as a service electric vehicle, you'd be paying 16 cents a mile in 2020, and you'd be paying 10 cents a mile in 2030. If you used it as a pool, so you weren't the only one in the vehicle when you were being transported, five cents a mile in 2020 and three cents a mile in 2030. It's almost free over here. Can you imagine that, if that happened, that is massive disruption, right? I mean, that is such a huge, by X factor, of change that could happen. Now think about what that means. Three cents a mile. What does that mean for communities and low income workers and mobility? First of all, families, what they're predicting would save $5,600 a year in the transportation costs, in reduced transportation costs. It's equal to a trillion dollar tax cut essentially by 2030. But what's more interesting to me, what does it mean for like low income workers to be able to get to work? Right? You can imagine employers giving low-income workers, giving their wor employees a card that allows them just to, to come and go to and from work. Right? You could imagine people who were a distance away just you know, sleeping in an autonomous pool and getting to work, and it's, it's virtually free. So it's super interesting when you think about the public policy ramifications of that kind of change. So that's number two. Um, and, and then why, you might wonder why the cost is so cheap, and this makes absolute sen uh, sense to me. So individually owned vehicles are in use. Your car right now, it's parked in the parking lot, right? You're not using it. You park it at home at night. You park it at your work if you go to work during the day. You're not using it. You use it 4% of the time, essentially, on average. But transportation as a service, it's in use 100% of the time. And that's why you get the efficiency of being able to use it a lot, because these vehicles are constantly on the go. They're constantly moving. And so that's why it's so much cheaper. Electric vehicles, and this, these, and I'll get to that in a second, but are much lower maintenance. If these are electric vehicles, they're much lower maintenance than your internal combustion engine, because it only has 20 moving parts versus 2,000 in the internal combustion engine. Cars are gonna be built to travel because they'll be serviced 500,000 to a million miles. Can you imagine? Your car right now, if it gets over 100,000 miles, you're trading it in. If your car goes 500,000 miles because it is an electric vehicle and therefore the maintenance and it can last much longer, and we'll talk just a second about what it means for the, the OEMs or the car manufacturers, it's a total different ballgame. So, super cheap, cost plummets. Number three, prediction is that transportation greenhouse gas emissions completely plummet. This is great news. First of all, the transportation as a service vehicles will all be electric. 
That's why you're going to see, and you see this, if any of you get The Economist, they had this cover on it the other day, Roadkill, the internal combustion engine on its back. It is going to die because you're going to see electric vehicles just take over. And in fact, oil demand for the oil industry is going to peak in 2020. This is what they're predicting. It'll peak in 2020. Prices are going to drop to $25 per barrel. Right now, it's about $51 per barrel. And by 2020, there will be about 100 million barrels per day sold, and 2030, 70 million bar barrels per day sold. So any of you who have stock or folks who are working in the fossil fuel oil industry, it's going to be a challenge for them, assuming that this happens with electric autonomous vehicles. Transportation-related fossil fuel energy demand will plummet by 80%. Bob, you're going to love that. And the tailpipe emissions will plummet by 90%. What a huge thing this will be for the planet, because it is truly the transportation sector that has not been addressed yet in the way that it needs to be in terms of our contribution to greenhouse gas emissions as human beings. So you're going to see transportation GHGs plummet. Number four is that you're going to see more usage of cars, but fewer cars. So as I mentioned, well, first of all, you're going to see way more miles traveled. Right now, there's 4 trillion passenger miles per year. But if it's super easy to take an autonomous electric vehicle, you're going to see 6 trillion passenger miles per year. But since your greenhouse gas emissions are going to plummet, it won't matter as much that there's so many more miles traveled. But what's interesting is that the cars per year are going to drop in terms of who is uh, in terms of the numbers that are being sold. So 18 million now roughly per year are being sold by 2030, it'll only be 5.7 million. So you saw the impact on the oil industry, you can now see the impact on the auto industry. If only 5.7 million cars per year as they project are going to be sold, it is a huge problem, right? So what does it mean? First of all, um, the challenges for cities and for public policy 50 billion in lost gas tax and parking ticket revenues. You won't have parking tickets because these cars won't be parking anywhere. You've got the 5 million driver jobs gone. Can they be replaced by you know, logistics jobs, maintenance, fleet management, other kinds of jobs related to autonomous transportation? You've got an oil industry collapse. The oil industry has got to shift in some way their strategy to renewables and to energy independence. They can be a partner or they can continue to, they can resist, they can be sort of Luddites, but somehow this is going to hit them in some big way. And that's true for the automakers as well. So what happens to them? Do they become owners of fleets of vehicles that are autonomous vehicles? What's their business model? That ha how do they, how do they you know, react to this kind of huge change? So it is, it is a big deal for a, a bunch of big industries in the US. And this I particularly love because surplus batteries you know, once a car has been traveled 500,000 miles, the battery actually still is usable. It's got 80% of capacity. So people are suggesting that you can apply these used batteries to the grid and use for grid storage of energy. And that would be equivalent to 200 gigawatts of grid, grid storage of annual annually added to the electric grid in the US. Or you could use it for distributed storage at your own house. You can use your, you know, use a, a formerly used battery if you have an individually owned autonomous vehicle or electric vehicle and use it for your own storage. So the batteries are huge economic opportunities too if you think of aftermarket uses of batteries. So just quickly, I have a, a Letterman-like top 10 list, although it's not funny, it's just a top 10 list um, of policy considerations for our students. So one, how do we respond to job losses? What do communities do to be able to make sure that people have a decent living wage? So people have talked about the universal basic income. I hate that. Um, people have talked about wage subsidies for low wage workers. That's very interesting. How will any of that be paid for? How do you encourage new industries and jobs in the US in a global economy? Those are all great policy questions for our students. Number two, how to most effectively train people to work with automation. Um, Sam is part of my class, Sam, and um, this is his, this is his, the, you're gonna solve this particular one because I know we're working on this. How do you train people for this new world? And we have such a terrible training um, 
ecosystem in the U.S. that we need to develop new models. And that, you know, on-the-job training, subsidized, not divorced from a job. We should be subsidizing employment rather than unemployment, blah, 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 blah. All of that are policy questions. Number three, how do you ensure state-by-state -state regulation of autonomous electric vehicles so you don't have a patchwork of regulation, that you have best practices among states? How do you replace lost local revenue from the lost parking uh, tickets and gas, gas taxes? Do you have a per mile, penny per mile tax, et cetera? How do you replace all of that? How do you replan cities when parking lots become completely unnecessary? So in Los Angeles, for example, they got 200 square miles of just parking right? That San Francisco could fit just in their parking spaces four times in the city of Los Angeles. What do you do with all that, that land, right? How, how do you plan for that? Um, and on average, cities do have 20 to 30 percent of parking space. That's extra space that could be used for a whole variety of things. Number six is how do you accelerate or how do you streamline permitting processes for the reconfiguration, for example, of garages into more lower income housing? How do you prevent monopolies in the vehicle operating system? Because this system itself is going to be hugely technologically based. There will be tons of people who make just a gajillion dollars from the vehicle operating system about this platform, which would have the logistics about how they get to your house and how they communicate with other vehicles and how that Technology alone is going to make people billionaires, but it's got to be open and transparent, and ability. there has to be an ability for the systems to talk to one another. Um, number eight is what do you do with the unused road space in the cities? Not just parking space, what do you do with that curb space? You're going to need some curb space to allow people to be picked up and dropped off, but in general, you're going to see a lot less need, obviously, for, for parking. Number nine, how do you create new rules of use for lanes on freeways? If you've got a bunch of these huge semi trailers and they could be with multiple semis attached to the same one, like conga lines of tractor trailers going down the freeway, perhaps at 90 miles an hour because it's a different universe because there are no people on the freeway. How do, you, how do you make sure that you have the logistics set up for that? Do you have off ramps that are separate for them? Do you have HOV lanes that the trucks use? These are all policy questions that we got to figure out. And number 10, how do you establish clear rules for accident liability, who owns the vehicle, who's responsible, et cetera. These are all public policy questions. So big finish. Who is going to ensure that the robots do not steal our jobs? Who is going to ensure that we retrain all those displaced workers? Who is going to ensure that our people are saved from despair and fear? Who is it? Jerry Brown. <laughs> is it? President Trump or our next president, whoever that is. Is it Henry Brady? Or is it Henry Brady ensuring that GSPP graduates fix all of these issues for us? Thank you all very much.